No longer should we consider this story in Genesis merely as a kind of prediction, but as an allegory of today's situation. Grace, law, and our natural strength are all here, and we are always being tempted to exercise our natural strength to coordinate with Hagar to produce an Ishmael to fulfill God's purpose. But we have a safeguard to check whether or not we have God's presence in our daily life and in our Christian work. The safeguard is not how much fruit we have, it's God's presence. Do you have the assurance, the confidence that day after day Christ is being brought into your being to be the inner life by whom you live? Do you have the assurance that this Christ is even becoming the realm in which you live? This realm is the church life. We need to have the seed and the land, the proper Christian life plus the church life. We need to live by Christ within and we need to live in Christ without. This is the proper way for us to fulfill God's purpose. We need to see this not for others but for ourselves. Abraham's biography is our autobiography and the allegory of the two women is a portrait of our life. As we live today, we need Christ as the seed and as the land. Life study of Genesis message 47, knowing grace for the fulfillment of God's purpose. God's covenant confirmed with circumcision. God's covenant confirmed. In this message, we come to Genesis 17, a record of God's crucial dealing with Abraham in confirming his covenant. We have seen that Abraham was called and that he received God's call, promise and covenant. After God called Abraham, he gave him the promise and then he confirmed the promise by making a covenant with him. After Abraham received the covenant, he accepted his wife's proposal to exercise his flesh along with the expediency of Hagar to produce a seed. The result was Ishmael. Here we see three things, Sarah's proposals, Hagar's expediency, and Abraham's exercise of the flesh to produce Ishmael. God's disappearing for 13 years because of Abraham's exercise of the flesh. Abraham might have thought that it was not serious for him to exercise his flesh to produce Ishmael, but according to God's economy for his eternal purpose, it was very serious. If we compare the first words of chapter 17 with the last words of chapter 16, we can see that between these two chapters, there was a period of 13 years and that there was no record of Abraham's life tr during those 13 years. When Abraham brought forth Ishmael, he was 86 years of age. And 13 years later, when he was 99, God appeared to him again. During that long period of 13 years, Abraham, a man called by God, a man who was living by faith and who was learning to know grace for the fulfillment of God's purpose, missed God's presence. How serious it is not to have God's presence. After Abraham had answered God's calling and had begun to live a life by faith in God for his assistance, he had a failure. Being short of faith, he went down to Egypt where he was even planning to sacrifice his wife. According to the human concept, that was much worse than using Hagar to produce Israel. But if we read these chapters attentively, we shall see that God was not as displeased with Abraham's going down to Egypt as he was with his using Hagar to produce Ishmael. Of course, it was not good for Abraham to go down to Egypt, but that did not affect God as much as his exercise of the flesh to bring forth Ishmael. Going down to Egypt was a failure without, but taking Hagar to produce Ishmael was failure with him. It was deeper, for it was not merely related to circumstances, but to life. Taking Hagar to produce Ishmael was not simply a matter of right or wrong, or of committing a sin. It was a matter of life. Nothing that we do by ourselves is life. Whatever we work by ourselves is not life. Life is God himself. It is God being something to us in our very being. We should not do anything by ourselves, but by God's being wrought into us. Whatever we do by ourselves is not life but death, for it is the issue of our natural life. In the eyes of God, our natural self is more dirty and more defiling than sin. 
although sin is unclean in the presence of God, it is not as offensive to God as our natural self is. While we all recognize the seriousness of sin, not many people realize the seriousness of our natural self. If we commit a sin, we would immediately confess it to God. But if we do certain good things by our natural self, we do not have the sense that we are offending God. If I hate a particular brother, it is easy for me to recognize that this hatred is a sin and confess it as such to God. But if I love this brother by my natural self, it would be difficult to realize that this is against God. Sin only offends God's righteousness, but our natural self offends God himself. God wants to come into us to be our life and our everything that we may live, work, and do everything by him. But when we do things by ourselves, our natural self, we put him aside. By this, we can see that the natural self is against God himself. It's not only against God's righteousness or holiness, but against God himself. God's intention with Abraham was that he would work himself into Abraham so that Abraham might bring forth a child to fulfill God's purpose. God did not intend that Abraham do this by his natural strength. Nevertheless, Abraham used his natural strength to bring forth a child to fulfill God's purpose. Nothing offends God more than this kind of natural doing. Working by our natural self is the most offensive thing to God. To Abraham, it was not so serious for him to take Hagar, his wife, Sarah. He would propose this thinking that it would help Abraham to produce the seed, since Abraham was old and she was out of function. But God had promised that they would have a son. Since they did not know how this could come about, they took the expediency of using Hagar, the Egyptian maid, to produce a child, not realizing how offensive that was to God. It was an insult to him. Therefore, God disappeared from his dear court wife for 13 years. It was as if God had turned his face away from Abraham and had refused to speak to him for that length of time. There is no record in the Bible of what happened during that period of time. We only know from the last verse of chapter 16 and the first verse of chapter 17 that God reappeared to Abraham 13 years later. According to the Bible record, 13 years of Abraham's life were wasted. In the heavenly record, those years were lost because Abraham exercised his natural self to do something for the fulfilling of God's purpose. Perfection required by God's all-sufficiency. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1 says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the all-sufficient God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Here we see that God charged Abraham with two things, that Abraham had to walk before this all-sufficient God and that he had to be perfect. In chapter 16, Abraham did not walk before God. He walked before Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael. Since he had not walked before God, God came and told him to walk before him and to be perfect. God's telling Abraham to be perfect indicates that before that time he was not perfect. In chapter 16, Abraham was imperfect. He lacked something. 